to the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. Stay blessed. Very briefly, and then we'll pray. Just to open our eyes to the mysteries of the kingdom that empower the saints to rise and walk in victory. Job chapter 42, please, and verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, Job said, but now my eye seeth thee. I have heard of a theoretical God. I've heard of him from someone else, but now I have an encounter myself. John chapter 4, very interesting story. Let's start from verse 39. John chapter 4, from verse 39. This was an encounter that Jesus had, if you remember your scripture, with the woman by the well, the Samaritan woman we call it. We're reading down to verse 42. Ready? It says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. Look at this now. This was when Jesus had an encounter with the woman. She was so touched. She ran and said, come see a man that had told me what I had done. Now, they did not know Jesus. They had not met him. But they believed the woman. Please keep the scripture there. They believed on him, not because they had an encounter. They believed because they trusted the woman's word. And many of the Samaritans in that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever did. Next verse. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. They heard him teach. Are you seeing the levels now? They had the woman's testimony, and so they came to church. But now they heard Jesus teach himself, verse 42. Let's read together, please. One, two, read. And they said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of your sayings, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Supernatural encounters. That it is possible that the testimony of someone or his dealings with God can be so alluring, it can bring you to God. But that the, the God's ultimate desire is not that you know him as the God of another person. His desire is to bring you an encounter. Are we blessed? All through scripture we see that many people had encounters with God and it became the basis for their conviction, their stability, and their exploits. Write this down, please. An encounter is a supernatural experience that brings the reality of God to a person or a people. A supernatural experience that brings the reality of God to a person or a people. They are called encounters. So when you hear about the wonders, when you hear about the great things that God has done and continues to do in the life of people, it, it cultivates that hunger but their testimonies are not enough. You must come to God and have an encounter that produces convictions. If we do not contend for genuine encounters, this generation may not have the power and the stamina to, to stand the reality of the times that we are in. Are we together? 
the days that we are in, the revival, the awakening that is sweeping across the nation will not only require people of zeal, it will require people of encounter. Are we blessed? And by the grace of God and by the privilege of the election of grace, I am a student of the move of God. I have studied the moves of God. I have studied men and women who have had encounters with God and the validity of their encounters were demonstrated in their lifetime. I've had the privilege of meeting a few people who were able to pioneer major revivals in their lifetime. And I thank God for the honor of being used by God to do a bit of that. So I, what I am speaking about respectfully is not theory. I know what I am saying. And if you pay attention to these truths, I assure you that something will come upon you in this conference and you will run like the foxes of Samson in the name of Jesus Christ. There are four dimensions of encounters that I believe from Scripture, every believer that intends to manifest the kingdom, every believer that intends to do business with God in these last days, you must contend for these dimensions of encounters. They produce maturity and they produce balance in the life of the believer. Hallelujah. Very quickly, I'll run through them and I want you to please pay attention. The words that we speak, they are spirit and life. It's not just an education. It's not just an intellectual communication. This is not just a theological dissertation. This is the ministry of the spirit. Hallelujah. Four encounters. I submit to you, let me tell you a little story. I'm a student of scripture. I study the Bible by the grace of God. But this teaching came to me by revelation. I was not reading any Bible. The Holy Ghost came to me and began to open me up that there are four dimensions of encounters and that I must teach the body of Christ this truth to help believers mature and really begin to prove the reality of the power of God. Can I tell you this? A generation is gradually getting tired of religion. A generation is gradually getting tired of spiritual propositions without the grace dimension to, de to deliver their validity. And technology has made people know that things can be proven. You can say this and there are statistics to prove it. It is that same hunger now. People have brought it to the church to say, if you claim God is God, if he heals, if he lifts, if he blesses, I am sick and tired of theory. I want an experience that whose conviction will last my lifetime. And if we are unable to deliver to that degree, then sooner or later, many people will forget the name of the Lord. But may God forbid it, not in our lifetime. Are we blessed? Yes. Encounters. Number one, the first supernatural encounter that every believer needs in this order to be relevant and to be able to host dimensions of God in your life to a territory to a generation is called an encounter with Jesus, the Son of the living God. Please write it down. An encounter with Jesus, the Son of the living God. John chapter 3, the Bible says, and verse 16, popular scripture says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the intent that whosoever believeth in him should not perish eternal damnation. The word perish there does not necessarily just mean die physically. Eternal damnation, but that we should have what the Bible calls Zoe, the life of God. Everybody say, encounter with Jesus. There are many people in church who have not met Jesus. There are many people around Christian circles who have truly not had an encounter with Jesus. You can be around the things of God. You can even be part of the move of God. But an encounter with Jesus is not corporate. Number one, it is a personal affair. 
Those days, well, in the south here, I think it was student union, and then in the north it was FCS. They would ask you, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? That word personal was the key word. Not have you been around church for a while. A personal encounter with the Lord Jesus. First John chapter 5, the epistle of John. First John chapter 5. Help us, Holy Spirit. First John chapter 5, we'll start from verse 11. First John 5 and 11. This is the record that God hath given us eternal life and that this life is in his Son. Next verse, please. It says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Period. So if you say you are born again, then that must have been that you have encountered the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world. Can I tell you this? We need by the grace of God to remind a generation again that there is no other name given unto man by which men can be saved. Believing a man of God does not give you salvation. Brothers and sisters, hear me. Believing a living church does not give you salvation. Believing an apostle, a prophet, following an apostle, a prophet, a teacher, as important as it is, you are only an effective follower. You are not saved. Are we together? According to the authority of scripture, the condition for being a partaker of the life of God is not proximity with the anointing. It's not proximity with church. It's a personal encounter with the son of the living God. You will think what I'm teaching is so basic and simple and everyone should know. Except for the fact that the day there is a day that this earth will be judged. And let me tell you, whoever does not have that encounter with the son of God, he says, I saw saw that the sea gave up its dead. Everyone gave up his dead and whosoever's name was not in the book of life was casted into the lake of fire that burned with sulfur and brimstone. This, he said, is the second death. And he said, right, for these things are faithful and true. I don't mean to make you afraid, but I tell you sincerely, one day this earth will wrap up. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. We establish this in the future. In, in, in the morning and it's not going to be in so distant future I am convinced personally from the authority of scripture because the one sign the Bible gives to characterize the coming of Christ is that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all generations they don't have to receive it, it there just has to be a testament that they had it and the Bible says then the end will come An encounter with the Son of the living God. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, The thief cometh not. That means you will never see the thief around any vicinity, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he said, But I am come that ye may have life, and that you may have that life more abundantly. So the first encounter you need that starts your journey, your Christian experience, more than church, more than a pastor, more than a man of God is an encounter with the son of the living God. We are all sons of the living God, but there is the son of the living God, Jesus the Christ. There is no other name given unto men by which we must be saved. Respectfully, do you know that you can do a random selection around church and really ask people, are you saved? And you will be surprised how many people are not saved. They are committed, they are sincere, they are not evil people, but they are just not saved. Sincerity is not the condition to be with Jesus. It is salvation. Romans chapter 10, from verse 8 to 10. The word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The formula is in the next verse. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Then with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Hallelujah. There are three things 
that you receive for having an encounter with the Son of the living God. Please write it. According to the authority of Scripture, if and when you truly have an encounter with the Son of the living God, there are three things that you receive. Number one, access to righteousness. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. These are fundamentals of the Christian faith that if not known, every other dimension of truth will be standing on a wrong foundation. Romans 5 and verse 17, please. Access to righteousness. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, it says much more we, they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ righteousness great men like E.W. Kenyon who had been a great blessing to the body of Christ and still continue to bless the body of Christ even though they have long gone I think he defined one of my first definitions of righteousness came from his books the ability to stand before the father's presence without a sense of inferiority condemnation and guilt that's what he defined as righteousness. Even though today I would say righteousness is more than just a sense of being free. Righteousness is actually the nature of God. Without righteousness, you cannot receive Zoe. The condition to have the life of God is that you have righteousness equal to that of Jesus. So before you receive the life of God, you must receive righteousness. Righteousness is what qualifies you to be a partaker of the life of God. It is impossible to have the life of God until you have righteousness. Are we blessed? The first thing we receive from having an, a genuine encounter with the Son of God is righteousness. The righteousness of the Son of the living God at work in me that I have received it. Number two, the second thing that we receive when we have an encounter with Jesus, the Son of the living God, is access to the life of God, what the Bible calls Zoe, the life of God. Zoe is more than eternal life. Please look up. There are different kinds of life. And some of you may have heard me teach that Zoe is not eternal life. Everybody has eternal life. The condition for eternal life really is not being born again. It's being born once you pass through the womb of a woman, you have eternal life. Whether in this earth or beyond this earth, you are still living. The life is eternal. When you get people saved, you say, where will you spend eternal life? Not will you. You are going to spend eternal life. The question is location, not the possibility. Are we together now? Remember Jesus, we are Bible students, isn't it? Remember Jesus was talking to, he was giving a parable about the rich man and Lazarus. Both of them had eternal life. It was just location. The man was still alive after this earth. So the life Jesus came to give us, I know that he was translated eternal life, but it's not really eternal life. It's called Zoe, the life of God. It's a quality of life, the very kind of life. Great men like Papa Hagin call it the God kind of life. Well, I respect and I believe them, but revelation is progressive. It's not the God kind. It is the very life of God. There are not many kinds. It is God's life given to men. Are we blessed? A superior kind of life. This is what I get when I encounter the Son of the living God. Now, because it is spiritual in nature, you may not appreciate it. We are sensory. So when things happen and you have a physical impact, usually you will believe it. But when you, when you receive of his life in what you call the salvation experience, usually you may not necessarily feel anything physical. So it may be difficult for you to believe that a translation and an exchange just happen in the spirit. But it is still the truth of scripture that anyone who encounters the Son of God has the life of God. Please say, I have the life of God. <laughs> Number three, what do you receive for having an encounter with the Son of God? Access 
to the grace of God. Hmm. Access to the grace of God. Access to the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 1, please, and verse 3. The grace of God is a powerful mystery. This is my definition of the grace of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is my definition of grace. Grace is more than just unmerited access. Grace is the generic name given to every spiritual blessing that is given to the believer routed through the office of the Christ. It's called grace. So anointing is grace. Wisdom is grace. Faith is grace. All spiritual blessings that have been given to the saints but can only be accessed through the office of the Christ is called grace. When you limit your understanding of grace to just um, unmerited access or being pardoned from iniquity by reason of being in Christ, it is very, very limiting. So when we have access to grace, it's more than just favor. Uh -uh. That's why the Bible says grace and peace be multiplied unto you. And then the Bible says that, um, how, how does he put it? It says God is able to make all grace. I think I shared that the last time I was here. The grace of God. Unfortunately, and, and lovingly speaking, for most believers, our our understanding of grace just has to do with the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ and receiving it and then, and then that's all. But grace is more than that. Grace represents every spiritual blessing allocated for the victory of the saints, but it is only routed in Christ. An unbeliever cannot have grace, can have mercy, but not grace. Are we blessed? The grace of God only comes through the office. The administrator of the grace of God is Christ himself. Is God helping us now? So if you tell me you have encountered Jesus, I search for this. Notice my choice of words. Access to righteousness. Access to the life of God. Access to the grace of God. What does access mean? Potential. It does not mean experience. Access means that the door has been opened. But it is up to you to come into the experience of it. For instance, we have received the way the life of God. But Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18 says, Having their understanding darkened, it says, Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness that is in their heart. So it is true that he that had the Son had life, but because it is access, it takes a level of spiritual illumination to come into the experience of it. This is where faith is applicable so it is by grace but then through faith to become our experience are we blessed many believers continue to chant spiritual realities that the grace of God has provided and sometimes we never get to walk into the experience of it because grace gives you access and access is important but that's not what you really need what you need is an experience is God blessing us? Let's hurry up for the sake of time. Number two. I pray and trust that this is blessing your heart. Number two. The second encounter that you will need to be mighty with God in this earth and in this season is an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Please write it down. In this order, an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Mm. 
Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Joshua Selman, saying, This destiny and this kingdom advance is not by might, is not by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. By my spirit, your destiny, your excelling ministry, business, family, advancement, the manifestation of the hand of God within a territory. Please hear me. The Bible says it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by the spirit of God. Whilst it is true that the Holy Spirit plays an active role in the revelation of Jesus, the Holy Spirit as one of the, the Godhead has a separate office that an individual can encounter. Please listen. The Holy Spirit is there to create conviction. Jesus was teaching and he said, I have many things to tell you, but he cannot bear them now. He said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he shall guide you into all truth. Is that true? He will testify of me, he said. But the Holy Spirit, listen to me, as God has a separate office that you will need to encounter, the person and the office of the Holy Ghost. Isaiah 48 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 48. Did I get that right? Give me Isaiah 30 and verse 21. Isaiah 30 and verse 21. It says, thine ears shall hear a word from behind you saying, this is the way. If someone who speaks to you, walk ye in it and you will find rest. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right and when you turn to the left. You will hear a voice saying, a voice. The same word is used in Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the Lord walking, the voice of the Lord walking in the cool of the day. That voice is a person. And even though Jesus came and walked upon the earth, Jesus is the word. The Holy Spirit represents the voice of God to the saints. Please understand this. Jesus Christ is the word, but the Holy Ghost represents the voice of God. This is what I'm trying to establish. It's very, very important you understand this. If you do not encounter the office and the person of the Holy Spirit, your hearing in this kingdom will have a problem. And your rest is predicated on your hearing. The person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When I started out with God, I used to watch a lot of Catherine Kuhlman's videos and Benny Hinn. And I would hear them cry and talk about the Holy Spirit. And I felt, it, it felt so strange. How could you talk about someone you don't see? How could you talk about someone who looks unseen? But the reality, the substance of what they were saying, it was so real, they would cry, they would sob. I knew they were not lying. I knew there was a dimension of reality that they were operating on. Catherine Kuhlman would cry on stage and say, he's my best friend. Don't offend my best friend. Pastor Benny will continue to shout and say, ah, oh, he's the Holy Spirit until I began my journey with God. And when I was introduced to the person and the office of the Holy Spirit, my life changed. I knew hmm, that he could take a weak person, my brothers and my sisters, when the Holy Spirit holds you, he can turn you into a sign and a wonder. Many have encountered the Son of the living God. They have the life of God, but they are unable to be effective in this Christian experience because you need an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit to believers? Number one, the Holy Ghost is the revealer of the Word of God. Please write it down. 
The Holy Spirit is the revealer of the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 9 to 12. Sorry, I'm hurrying up because we're working with time. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 9 to 12. But as it is written, the Bible declares, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Uh -huh. But God had revealed them. How? By the Spirit. That means if you do not have access to this spirit, you also do not have access to genuine revelation. The Holy Ghost is the revealer of the word. Please keep that scripture there. It says, for the spirit is given the exclusive ability to search all things, even the deep things of God. Verse 11. For no man for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of that man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Hallelujah. It says now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God to the end that we might know revelation the things that are freely given to us from God when you see men acting as though they outsource a dimension of knowledge from another realm you are right but the bringer of that revelation is the spirit of God that the Holy Spirit is able to fetch truths from the bowels of heaven and bring it to ordinary men and turn their lives to signs and wonders the Holy Ghost is the revealer of the word John chapter 16, when you read from verse 13, the Bible tells us, John 16 and verse 13, please give it to us, that how be it when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you. You see how complicated truth is. It's not enough to have access to truth. You must be guided because truth without guidance can still kill you. It's not only a lie that kills. Truth unguided can also destroy Did you ever learn that the truth too can kill? He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. Are you seeing now? Here, this scripture is the reason why the Holy Spirit conceals his presence. The Holy Spirit, I believe, according to the authority of scripture, has a real form. But the reason why he conceals his form is because his assignment is to glorify Jesus. <laughs> Are we together? That he will not speak of himself and he will, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. The Holy Spirit is not anointing oil. In fact, oil does not anoint. Oil only anoints because someone anointed anointed it. I'm not against that. Don't, don't get me wrong. The Holy Spirit is not water. The Holy Spirit is not wind. The Holy Spirit is not smoke. These are just expressions of his person. The Holy Spirit is God. God in every way. God in every form. There is an office of the Holy Ghost. And hear me, dear people of God, this is a call to come into that level of encounter with the person and the office of the Holy Spirit. The revealer of the word. Number two, very quickly. What is the assignment? What does the encounter with the person and the, whole, the ministry of the Holy Spirit bring? He is the confirmer of the word. The Holy Spirit does not only reveal the word, he confirms the word. Isaiah 44 from verse 24, please, to 26. We're doing a little Bible study here. Isaiah 44 from verse 24 to 26. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretch forth the heavens alone, and spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, 25, that frustrated the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish, 26, let's read together, that confirmed the word of his servant, and performed the counsel of his messengers. 
Hear me. The Holy Spirit is the dimension of the Trinity that is responsible for manifestation. You cannot desire manifestation and neglect his office. Every provision that the word of God makes available, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it manifest. Very powerful. So when you say be healed in the name of Jesus, you have spoken that word by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is that active dimension of the Trinity whose power goes into that sick body and begins to make biological, spiritual adjustments until that person looks like what the word of God should be. He will not stop. For many years in the body of Christ, there has been a controversy between the limit of the ministry of the word and the ministry of the spirit. So we have people who say word and we have people who say spirit. Both of them are incomplete. I pray that God will answer that question in this short session. In the name of Jesus Christ, the ministry of the spirit as the confirmer of the word. Mark 16 and verse 20. Mark chapter 16 and verse 20. The Bible says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. The Lord walking with them when they preached and they said, This is what we've brought to you from heaven. The Holy Ghost was there with them. He is with you and shall be in you, walking to will and to do. Men of God, hear me. We need the Holy Spirit to walk close to us if we need real results. It is the Holy Spirit that has the ability to produce supernatural results. No man sustains the ability to produce results at God's dimension except assisted by the Holy Ghost. We're tired of the status quo There's gotta be more than this We're tired of the status quo There's gotta be more than this There's gotta be more, gotta be more There's gotta be more than this There's gotta be more it's gotta be more. The Holy Ghost is also the custodian of the anointing. Please write it down. The Holy Ghost is the custodian of the anointing. Mm. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord, he said, the messianic prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, that Spirit, hath anointed me too. Then it begins to list everything that the anointing does. To preach, it takes the anointing to preach glad tidings. It takes more than understanding the message of salvation to preach. It takes the anointing. It takes the anointing to bind up broken hearts. It takes the anointing to proclaim liberty to the captives. It takes the anointing to open the prison to them that are bound. It takes the anointing to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and even the vengeance of our God. It takes the anointing to comfort people who mourn. It takes more than a sympathetic heart. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Micah chapter 3 and verse 8. I have power, he says, by the Spirit. Micah chapter 3 and verse 8. But truly, I am full of power, not by my ability, by the Spirit of the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers men in this kingdom. We are all ordinary except for what he does in us. He reconfigures us by his power. And suddenly we cease to be normal. We cease to be ordinary. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus himself but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and unto the utmost part of the earth. You shall receive power. The Holy Ghost is the custodian of the anointing. Just because you are born again 
may not necessarily expose you to the anointing. It gives you access to that possibility. But you need an encounter with the person and the office of the spirit. I do not know one man on earth who works notably in dimensions of the anointing. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is strange to that individual. I am yet to find one. There is no man that works truly in the miraculous, that works truly in signs and wonders of all forms, not just in the fivefold ministry. You must be exposed to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. I want you to keep doing something for this man of God, our man of God, Apostle Joshua Salmon. And that is, I want you to keep on praying for him that the cause of the gospel may have free flow in him, that he may be granted boldness to continue with his commission of Jesus Christ and that all provisions be given unto him as he continues in this journey of Christianity. And then don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you are new here. Don't also forget to leave a comment in the comment section and then keep sharing, keep sharing abroad and let's all keep sharing Jesus. I'll see you again. Bye.